Economists are sometimes accused of focusing too much on efficiency and not enough on equality. They spend too much time, so the criticism goes, thinking about whether the pie is as big as it could possibly be, and not enough time thinking about how it's carved up. So should economists and policymakers think more about distribution, and if so, how? Welcome to a special edition of The Big Question, the monthly video series from Chicago Booth Review. We're filming in front of a live audience on the campus of the University of Chicago. I'm Hal Weitzman, and with me to discuss the issue is an expert panel. Marianne Bertrand is the Chris P. Dialinas Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at Chicago Booth. She's also the faculty co-director of Booth's Rustandi Center for Social Sector Innovation and faculty director of the Poverty Lab at the University of Chicago Urban Labs. Eric Hurst is the V. Dwayne Rath Professor of Economics and John E. Duke Faculty Fellow at Chicago Booth. He's also Deputy Director of the Becker Freeman Institute at the University of Chicago. And Nicholas Epley is the John T. Keller Professor of Behavioral Science at Chicago Booth and Faculty Director of the Center for Decision Research. He's the author of MindWise, How We Understand What Others Think, Believe, Feel and Want. Panel, welcome to the big question. Marianne Bertrand, is there an inherent tension between efficiency and equality? Yeah, definitely. Um, and as economists, we're really focused on, you know, on efficiency. I think the idea behind it is that we have scarce resources and we are trying to always think about how we allocate these resources to create the most value possible. That's really our focus. That's the pie that you were talking about. But, you know, kind of issues of like distribution of these, you know, this value that's being created, distribution of these resources come up uh, typically as a second step. But it's inherently this tension between the two? There will be a tension. Okay. Uh, Nick Kepley, if we're trying to kind of, you know, go after two goals that are diametrically opposed or trade off in this way, is that always inherently a hard thing to do? Whenever you have a situation where you've got two goals you could be uh, pursuing at the same time, it turns out to be a very hard thing for any individual to do. Um, and that then produces a, a general bias in behavior, you might think, of a pursuing one goal at a time, often at the expense of others. So if you're thinking about what might be good for me today, it can be hard at the same time to think about what might be good for me a month or a week or two months from now. Um, if you want uh, to cut a piece of paper, right, you might choose the thing that only does the, the one thing that satisfies that goal best instead of choosing a tool that maybe uh, serves many goals, like a Swiss Army knife that could also cut this paper, but isn't uh, only meant for cutting a piece of paper. And so, in general, you find that decision makers are myopic. And so, when you have tensions like this between one thing we might value on the one side and something else we might value at the same time, generally what happens is you end up prioritizing one over the other. But, but, but the, I mean, the economists would argue that it's the, the right thing is indeed to focus on efficiency because then we do indeed have the biggest pie possible and then there's a second problem for society or policymakers or voters to decide which is how they want to put in place policies to redistribute this pie among, you know, among people. But then question emerged because economists also have some views as to you know, kind of efficiency considerations that go in that second stage of that process. And there's some assumptions built in there, right? Particularly yeah. about, Eric Hurst, about labor markets. There's, isn't there an assumption that labor markets clear in some sense, that workers transition to other jobs? Yeah, so now we're talking about you know, very specific types of shocks. So usually when we start thinking about, you know, is trade good for the populace or not? And in an efficiency standard, people, you know, we write down models and we take derivatives and we kind of say it's good where countries could you know, move towards their comparative advantage and one country specializes in good X, another one specializes in good Y, and we trade for each other. But the people who used to, if you think about like manufacturing in the United States, who used to produce tradable goods that are now being produced abroad, they no longer, um, you know, have the same demand for their employment as they did before, and they get dislocated. And as they get dislocated, you know, they pay some costs. Now in a frictionless labor market, those costs are pretty small. You get fired on this side of the room, you just move to that side of the room, everybody gets a job, everybody's fine, we all get the benefits of lower prices from trade. If there's a little bit of a barrier though between moving from this side of the room to this other side of the room or from labor market A to labor market B, that pr provides some sort of cost to those workers that you know, when we start thinking about how you know, the the cost uh, distributional effects of trade, that's a cost that many of our models that we write down in textbooks don't have because we assume these frictionless markets in the labor market. And just to be clear there, I mean, this could also be, if we assume these perfectly functioning labor markets when we do, say, our study of trades, we may, even if we just solely, on, solely focus on efficiency, 
make the wrong calculations, mm -hmm. is that on net, there might not be efficiency gains from the trade policy if you realize that indeed there will be permanent losses for some of the workers that are being yeah. displaced by other trade. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. And so that's, that's no longer a distributional question because it might mean that we start with models that assume perfectly function, functioning labor markets and then once we you know, kind of look at the real labor markets and the losses that will be created in the labor market, in fact, the policy did not increase the pie. It so, made the pie so that might, smaller. That might have set the first order, second order prioritization. Yes, this is exactly earlier. right. So I think this is, the, this is a, a problem beyond kind of the one that I just described. I mean, the problem that I described first, okay, so it seems reasonable to try to make the pie as big as possible and then focus about, about distribution after. But sometimes some of the models that we, that we use to um, define some policies um, may also not increase the size of the pie because they build on assumptions that are not realistic, right? So, so, so can you say more specifically what these frictions actually are that economists Let me give about? you a, a, an so, example what? first, and then we could, we could talk about specifics of what these frictions might be. So in the example might be that historically, you know, 120 years ago, 140 years ago, most of us were farmers, okay? And then some technology comes along, uh, a robot, we called the robot a tractor um, at that point, and then it created tremendous amounts of uh, efficiency gains in the farming industry in a way that dislocated workers. The tractor substituted for labor. And then over that 120 years, most of us in the population migrated from farming to other types of sectors. So when you think about these transitions, there's an inherently, you know, we always know that the, the labor markets aren't perfectly frictionless, but how quick the speed of adjustment is from sector A to sector B is important. So with Marianne's example early on, with a trade shock, might you not raise the pie um, in the short run when we take into account these distributional effects. If enough adjustments occur in the long run, then maybe the pie gets bigger. So what are these frictions that we usually think about in the labor market? Those frictions come along you know, I'd say kind of three dimensions. One dimension is people could move sectors within a given location for a same level of skill. The second thing is they can move locations and get jobs in another place, again, for the same level of skill. And the third thing, which is we, we see over long periods of time, is they could accumulate more skill. They go to school, get training, et cetera. And in those types of models, we tend to move up the skill distribution. So the frictions are how costly it is it for people to move places, how costly is it for somebody to move to another sector within a place, and then third, how costly it is it for them to go and acquire skills to then have the labor um, you know, endowments that the, the, the market is demanding at a time. So if there's frictions in any one of those, or if those frictions are getting more pronounced today relative to the future, which I believe they are, yeah. They're relative to the past, then I believe they are, then that could make these, these, dis uh, these issues more salient. And we do have some estimates, so I think in the labor literature yeah. there's lots of work on trying to estimate how long lasting the effects are of job losses or of, you know, of mass layoff and you know, suggest that you, know, you go 20 years later and people that you know, have been laid, you know, laid off in such a way have certainly not kind of returned to the level of earnings that they had before. I think the kind of magnitudes I think would suggest like uh, someone that loses a job via mass layoff loses hundred thousand dollars in you know in that present value of, yeah. of lifetime earnings. And the question then is, can the young yeah. come in and yeah. adjust? Is it the short run in the sense it might be long for the individual, but short run for society as a whole because the young come in and adjust? And I do believe we could talk about later that frictions are more pronounced today for different reasons than they were than they were in the past. Okay, well, well, let's come to that question. Right, I, I now, let's to, move to it now. That's great. <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Marianne Bertrand, this, if this tension has always been with us, what is particularly acute now? Is it to do with globalization or, or populism? or Why do we care about it particularly today? I don't know. I mean, it's linking back to you know, the reaction that we had in class, I think, that triggered this event. And, I think. and just, just to explain, no, so this, this, this conversation about, was you know, conversation by... about job losses yeah. in, uh, in West Virginia. So I think this was very locally a conversation about job loss in West Virginia. So I think, um, I think the current political environment, I think, very much you know, triggered you know, those questions and those reactions. Is that... I think we have, you know, we now live in a moment where um, some of these, you know, these groups that have been on the receiving sides of, you know, kind of many of the shocks that, you know, may have been very good for society overall, have expressed, expecting themselves, I think, probably much more than they were doing, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Okay. And, and Eric, I mean, is it, is it partly due with globalization, 
affecting the labor market more than in the past? No, I mean, I think globalization is a salient factor, and that might have started some of the, the changes that were occurring, particularly in the, in the industrial Midwest around manufacturing and energy. Uh, but I think it's more technology now than it was in automation, in, in a sense. In this, we just produce certain types of goods with technology now more than labor, particularly low-skilled goods. And as a result, that you know, displaces workers with lower levels of skills. Now, why is that different than the past? That has always happened. Think about the tractor example. Mm -hmm. But back when we had the tractor, the booming economy at the time, or the booming sector, was manufacturing. And if you could take an agricultural worker and a, the skill set they had, and the manufacturing worker, the skill set they had, they were very substitutable with each other. So the, again, the friction was smaller because the migration was easier. Now, we're basically moving lots of low-skilled jobs together, and then so it, it's... Yeah. It, so I very much agree with what you said. I think all the evidence would point that, you know, kind of skill-based musical change, machines are a bigger factor than, than trade, but I think it is very clear that we think about the narrative of what's going on right now. Trade is the one thing that people have picked up on, I think, because there's a much better narrative to be... Um, to be written uh, by you know politicians that want to you know kind of um, kind of take this you know this energy, which is that it's hard to get people angry at machines. It's easier to get people angry at um, at the Chinese or at immigrants. But the counterfactual, one thing, and we should hear Nick's thoughts on this. But the one thing counterfactual is if we start putting up trade barriers. So manufacturing jobs are about six million jobs less in 2017 than they were in 2000. Okay, and some trade might have been some impetus, but technology has, has contributed to that, right? Because manufacturing output is actually up, despite manufacturing employment being down. And with that, you know, at least from my perspective, putting trade barriers back on the market that look like 2000, suppose we get rid of China completely, um, manufacturing employment in the U.S. will look nothing like it did in 2000, just because the automation was so severe. So even though that's a focal point mm -hmm. in the discourse, it is misguided in terms of the underlying forces that are going on. Um, and I think that just means we keep that in mind when we talk about policy. Yeah, there seems to be a, a, a deeper psychological friction here, and I'm, I'm just curious how economists think about this. And that has to do with individual identity. So you know, if, if we go back to the example of losing jobs in the coal industry in West Virginia, these guys who are losing their jobs are coal miners. That's not just a job they have. It's their identity, it's who they are, it's what their parents and grandparents, their fathers and grandfathers were. It's deep in them. So you could imagine that they could go to Walmart and make the same amount of money, but that's not gonna be the kind of thing they're gonna wanna do. So switching jobs across sectors or into something that doesn't yeah. seem as meaningful or as consistent with their identity um, with, creates with the, another the, friction. That only kind of reinforces the point I think we were trying to make at the beginning is that, you know, kind of the efficiency calculations that we do without taking into account, you know, not only do they put no weight on these job losses because they assume these people will move back to another job, you know, you're only reinforcing the fact that these job losses are really costly and, you know, make the pie, you know, kind of increase the pie that we get via trade or via, you know, via policy smaller than, you know, kind of all calculations, all naive calculations economists would suggest. Potentially co costly, though, in other ways that don't just have to do with the job loss, that is, with just the financial part, that is, the loss of it's identity utility. is also... Yeah, we would like it's to value that. I mean, but just, the key thing, know. thing to, to, to Nick's point, though, and I, I agree 100%, that is a part of the, the friction in the labor market is, you know, this uh, cost of adjustment, not only in dollar space, but in utility space. But we've been doing that for centuries as an economy. Now, the question is, how long does this period of lack of adjustment last? Some farmers who got displaced by the tractor suffered. You know, I mean, it just so happened it was right around the Great Depression, so people might not have been able to tease out the, the effect on well-being of the structural forces of agriculture with the big period of the Great Depression. But the, Great Dep the agriculture areas of the U.S. suffered immensely during the Great Depression. Some of it was weather-related, but some of it was this structural change. But adjustments happen. Now, the question is how quick that adjustment happens, and is there something well, different about this type of adjustment 
than other types of shocks we got that were large in the past. Well, I think the, the question though is what kind of adjustment was required in the past, perhaps compared to the present. So in the past, if you, know, if you lost your job as a farmer, there was probably another manual labor job you could take on where you were building something or creating something which is likely more consistent with your identity as a, as a farmer. The coal miners are being asked to go back to school to work in a call center, and these are not <laughs> These are not comparable ideas. But in any case, the, what I believe has been missing, and going back to the way you know, kind of I started thinking about it, which is like step number one, we make the pie as big as possible. Step number two, we think about the allocation of the pie. I mean, I think it is very clear that the U.S. has not spent much time on you know, optimizing step number two, in particular an environment where we've made the pie bigger by shrinking the size of the pie for some groups. Right? So, I mean, maybe, maybe this is not, you know, one view I have is that there's not as much a backlash against trade, for example, in Europe as there is in the US, yet trade has been also destroying a lot of jobs in Europe and it's not been, you know, as it is in the US. I would hypothesize that the reason why you don't hear, and there's all the form of populism kind of in Europe, we can talk about that, but you don't, you don't hear as much kind of bash, backlash against trades in Europe is that Europe has a stronger safety net model and a stronger social protection, you know, system in place so that whenever these jobs get destroyed, you know, kind of even if people lost, you know, sense of identity and things like that, there's, there's more of a, of a compensation that will come from the state to partly at least undo some of the, the concentrated losses that have incurred through trade. So and I think that the U.S. has been kind of lagging behind on thinking more about redistribution. I mean, we spend, and you may know the fraction, a very small amount of, of the budget is spent on, you know, um, kind of trade adjustment programs, uh, we don't have a good sense, my sense is that they're not very effective. This is, these are all afterthoughts. Um, yeah. what, if, what if the effort was, and I'm wondering if you could perhaps align these goals a bit of efficiency uh, and equality, if, if, if you thought more about maximizing another attribute, not money, but rather well-being, which is something that other countries perhaps attend to a little more by creating social safety nets and so on, and so this would, do things like consider, okay, if we're, you know, let's take a particular region of the country that's being transformed by technology. Are we maximizing meaningful jobs? Not just money going into an area, but actual meaningful work or well-being in some way in a, in a community. Because that then, money is part of that. Money is part of that calculation. But it's only one part of that calculation. And it may not actually be that, that big of a part of that calculation. You know, when, when, when you think about these policies coming through, or these, this issue coming through, there are margin, margins of adjustment that are taking place. So let's think about you know, the auto industry in Detroit. So people don't like to move, we know that, but they do eventually. You know, Detroit has moved from one of the top 10 largest cities, um, now well down uh, in the distribution because people have migrated out. So these adjustments do take place in the industry structure that Detroit had at the time, manufacturing in particular, kind of fell out of favor. Other types of industries grew other parts of the country and people migrated to that. And that does have some efficiency gains to it. People are moving to where the comparative advantage is. So when you start thinking about these policies, you know, there is, we right back to the beginning, an equity efficiency trade-off, even in the policies we're talking about now. And so when I like to think about it, it's like, you know, kind of saying, what are the costs, which we know these people are suffering, what are the benefits, maybe doing some margin of adjustment, whether it be moving to a different place or going to school or, you know, getting some training for another type of sector or maybe changing social norms or whatever that is, take time and have cost, they come with a benefit. And so thinking about the cost versus benefits is important. We tend to spend a lot of time about the benefits we're not always as focused on, on potentially these costs or how they might be changing across people or across time. Um, and I think that's, a, that's an important component. But isn't it the case that usually when you're talking about costs and benefits, you mean money? No. I write down money. People health. maximize utility. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, We've had yeah, experience just, of psychologists with utility. utility. And then we put so a dollar which, figure on it. Which, right? <laughs> we just we put just a dollar, we, we, we put a dollar, 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 we <laughs> Problem solved. So, it's utility. You know, Nick and I have had so, these conversations. All of behavior economics <laughs> is economics. It's just a different utility function. <laughs> and, so, and so I'm okay yeah. with that. I mean, there, but that, there are certain aspects of utility that are harder to calculate than others. Money's easy. Money's easy. And uh, I think that's so. To get back to the original question about thinking about efficiency versus equality, some of these costs are just hard to calculate, like cost of well-being, cost of health. 
um, cost to civil society and uh, all of those those are those are hard costs to calculate and I, and, and I think just and presumably in, people themselves find it hard to, to say how much their own wealth being is worth as well I mean, it's not oh just, yeah and, it's and not just people the, uh, think terribly question. about money they yeah no I mean the psychology of uh, of all of this is very complicated. People often don't know what necessarily is good for them, what will make them happy uh, down, the, down the road. They think more money will make them happy. It often doesn't. Um, no, there lots of complexity with this. But we can find out what induces utility or well-being at the moment. But I, but I think getting back to your original question about efficiency versus equality, um, in general, our models and the way we think about behavior are prioritized to focus on the things we can measure pretty easily. And um, that just that, that, that makes it hard to account for these other factors like loss of identity. How, where, do you, where do you put that in the equation? What does that even look like? Right, a coal worker's, a coal miner's not going to go and work at Walmart. They're just not. But there are ways you could do That's the efficiency calculation, I think, that would bring a bit more realism to, you know, kind of, the, you know, how far away from uh, the, 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 the fully, you know, kind of functioning labor markets, you know, that I assumed we are. I think the problem is that you have this slippery slope argument because then you know every model, every policy that we study has you know kind of some general equilibrium effects, and then when we start kind of trying to put those in the model, it you know has a slippery slope feeling. So we do this you know kind of efficient calculation in a simple way that gives us discipline, and you know I think there's some benefits to that. Eric, because you you talked earlier about the this slowdown in the adjustment mm -hmm. in labor markets. Why is that happening? So you know. So I've been puzzled by this, and I have some conjecture. So I'll give you, I'll tell you the puzzlement, which is, so we lost lots of manufacturing jobs in the 80s as well, not as much as we did in the 2000s, and it didn't show up in employment rates the same way that it is showing up now. And margins of adjustments were occurring, and we could use our statistical methods that, you know, we as a profession use, I use a lot in particular, is comparing locations that get a shock, see what happens to the people in those locations, and see how they are after the shock a decade or so later. And for a given size manufacturing shock in some measured sense, um, you could look at employment rates of the people who exposed to that shock in the 80s versus today, and it's very different today than it was in the past. And at the same time, we see declines in mobility across space. We see correlation in the sense that not only are manufacturing jobs going down now, but also all lots of other low-skilled jobs, backroom office, things of that nature are moving in the same direction. And this is something that I've been thinking about that in the back of my mind, which is we've had lots of adjustments in the past to pass shocks. And the people who haven't adjusted left yet to those pass shocks might be inherently different than the people who were exposed to those shocks in the past. So think about it and just go into schooling. Okay, so back in the day, very few of us ever got a college education. And then a shock comes along, the return to skill goes up, and we go and get some skill. Who's gonna go get the skill? The people who's the benefit of that skill is the most beneficial, and you start seeing that. And who is left? The people for whom skill is less beneficial. And as over time, that pool becomes more and more towards the latter group, which just means for a given size shock, that group much, might just be less responsive to these margins of adjustment than in the past. And that means as the societies grow and you have like skill-based shocks um, where it's harder to adjust and the skill could be skill times identity type shocks, um, the pool that is left are just less responsive. And we're moving in a way where many of us get skill and so those of us who are left might be just harder to move. Um, than the past. And I'm trying to formalize that and test that um, going forward, but it is something that we need to be in the back of our mind for uh, when we're, you know, as an economy that's, ages um, through, through That's time. really interesting. But how much of it could also be that simply that the number of options for low-skilled people today are not much so fewer than they were yeah. in the 1980s? Yeah, I mean, so the question then is, then do, do they go get skill? So the shock and skill price might be bigger um, than it is today. That just pushes people towards getting more skill, and we're actually seeing less. So I don't know if Marianne knows that the propensity to go and get schooling, particularly for men, has flattened pronouncedly um, over the last 20 years relative to the prior, you know, 100 years. And, you know, even though the skill, the return to skill, the price of skill, um, uh, is actually growing during this time period. We've tapped out the limit of the male brain. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you guys know, I don't know if you can see it back from there, she looked directly in my eyes when she said that. It was like, 
<laughs> it, it You're looking at me it too. Wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't really at you, Nick. <laughs> Good work, Marianne. <laughs> they put me in the middle for a reason. <laughs> I, I think you're going to be okay. Okay, we'll Just see. We'll it, see. It, raises, it raises, I think, an interesting question, though, which all of this also kind of flits around morality and ethics, too, about what people, what we ought to expect from people. And as a society, when we're forming these policies, what ought we be trying to do? And so I think one thing that's maybe just worth highlighting here is that economic models of efficiency assume that people ought to be responsive to shocks. That is maximally responsive. So the, you know, the working mother whose job is lost should now, because this job is no longer available, should just be willing to up and move to another, another job. The coal miner who loses his job in West Virginia but wants to continue living in this community and be part of this system should just be willing to up and leave the community and go to California where there, there are jobs. And um, I don't, you know, we don't, I don't know that there's a clear answer to that, but I think that's just an important assumption that's in the economic models. And we may decide that that's not the kind of country we want to live in, where we, that we have lots of money and you could imagine that we could make people happy where they, where they are. And I think if you thought maybe, I think maybe if we thought more about well-being actually incorporated some of these other non-monetary factors into well-being that might lead to very different kinds of policies. Because we wouldn't assume that people would want to do things or should do. Do, we, do you think psychologically we underestimate the impact of loss? You talked about that loss of identity. Um, I think that people probably do in the sense that if they were to actually change jobs, they would pick up a different identity and probably be OK in the long run. That doesn't mean, though, that people are going to necessarily, in the current moment, choose some outcome that's going to um, that's going to achieve that ultimate goal. People act on loss aversion. It's not always a sensible thing to do in terms of future happiness, but it's what drives choice, and that's what these models have to be sensitive to. Okay, so let's talk about what the model might look like. How would how should you talked about? You know, we could look more at these second order considerations. Yeah. How would that affect, you know, the first order considerations? How would that affect the whole well, way that economists model these situations? So as I said, I mean, I think going back to the efficiency calculation, I think mm -hmm. there are ways, and I believe like some people have been working on this. I think Eric Posner is, is one person here at the law school that's been thinking about how we could do this, you know, kind of cost-benefit calculations and incorporate whatever numbers, you know, we have gleaned, you know, from, you know, work in labor economics as to, what are the permanent you know, impact of these, you know, these job losses? And so I think you could do your standard, you know, kind of what's going to happen to prices um, you know, and what's going to happen to cost, and also kind of really incorporate this is the number of jobs that I expect will be destroyed, and this is you know, kind of what I think will be in total the, the dollar value of the, all these job losses, because skills that you know, people had invested in have disappeared. And this may lead to different different choices. I mean, the other approach, I think. That's but you're suggesting that something's happening. Is if it's technology, isn't it? That's just a. a well, that's process. that's that's certainly different. I mean, so now here I'm talking just about the things where you know, kind of, we are looking at policy decisions that are being made based on these calculations. So, should the EPA, you know, pass this this rule versus that rule? Should we open, you know, the door to trades? That they are, you know, I think they are concrete ways, they will not, they will try to proxy for what you're talking about. They'll try to proxy for putting like, you know, a dollar figure on this, you know, kind of this identity factor and what, you know, kind of digital velocity you get from losing your identity. But we could try to move, you know, we could certainly try to move in this, di in this direction. I mean, I think the other thing, and I believe that that's already happening is, is also maybe paying more attention to uh, whenever we decide to pass a policy or not, uh, looking at concentrated losses. So I think there's such a thing as like feasibility analysis that some branch of government engage in where, you know, a certain policy may pass the, you know, the cost benefit test, but would, you know, really mean shutting down, you know, 80% of the plants in the particular, you know, county and that, you know, that is something that would be deemed to be infeasible. You're saying What's that's different there is just kind of looking at two things, looking at your cost benefit and then determining there's going to be a threshold as to how many, 
you know, job losses you are willing to have in a particular part of the country. So, and then you kind of find a way to balance these two considerations. And I don't You're know. You're saying how. that's already happening. I'm, you know, I'm saying yes. I think there are some, you know, kind of some parts of government that, you know, kind of do these feasibility analysis. Okay. At least as I understand. I think that with the, at least during the Great Recession, there was the auto bailout yeah. had the concentration uh, in in there for a particular area. We don't have a lot of policies that are designed to deal with these, you know, uh, long run adjustments. So if you think about the kind of the big transfer policies, particularly for men that are in the United States, there's unemployment insurance, and those are usually for short-term fluctuations. Um, you go into a recession, you want to help somebody for a couple of months or maybe up to a year or two um, kind of ride out the storm. And then we have disability, which is basically a, a long-term insurance program, usually for health shocks um, to, to kind of smooth out those types of shocks. The policies we have for industry decline and, and such, which are not health and they're not temporary like unemployment insurance, are relatively underdeveloped. We have a little bit around um, you know, trade adjustment type policies. You know, if you're exposed to trade, you could get a little bit of help uh, on the margins, usually around retraining. Um, and that's about it. So it doesn't really get to any of the types of stories that Nick might have said would be around in the background. It doesn't talk about some of the long run dynamics that we'd see. It doesn't talk really about this long run skill adjustment. So when you think about those, then how do you implement those policies that also don't have large efficiency effects on the background? That's the and thing. so that's the, and that's kind of the trade off is if you start transferring money to people in certain areas, that might slow down adjustments for the next generation or the generation after that. So how do you get the right policy to kind of manage these out? Suppose we <laughs> want to do these efficiency gained uh, types of policies. There are some losers. We want to redistribute the pie. We really don't have any mechanism right now for that redistribution for the types of shocks we might be experiencing in, in, in recent decades. Nick Epley, uh, what, what would the, uh, you talked about kind of general well-being what would a policy that, specifically a policy that kind of had that in mind look like? Well, so I think it would take into account a few things, and obviously you would sacrifice a bit on efficiency here, but let's, let's go back to the concrete example of the coal miners in West Virginia. So, I mean, there are analyses of what really drives well-being. Um, social connection turns out to be hugely important and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis for sure. Um, much, much bigger than, uh, than effects of, of income on day-to-day -day well-being, at least uh, happiness. And so it would take into account things like the cost of relocation when somebody picks up and moves and now they're not around uh, friends and relatives uh, that they've been around a long time, which is likely to, to uh, affect their health. But so it might do something like, let's, let's take these coal miners, they're involved in the energy industry, um, that's part of their identity. They're making power for the planet. You could imagine a policy that tries to keep them there, tries to uh, subsidize some other social good, like wind power. Instead of blowing the tops off of mountains, you could put windmills on top of them, retrain these workers to stay close. It's probably not the most efficient outcome. That's probably not the best place for the windmills, so you'd sacrifice on that a little bit. But the question would be, with the overall gain in utility, not just for those people, but for society as a whole, of keeping them there, retraining them to do green energy in the state of West Virginia, would that be better overall for well-being? And I think if you were to add well-being and health into some of these metrics, not just money in terms of efficiency, I think, the, I think some of these policies that wouldn't perhaps make sense on a pure efficiency uh, of, of money, monetary efficiency, calculation might, might start to make more sense. It okay. might seem better for overall. Level. Okay, well on that very practical note, unfortunately our time is up. My thanks to our panel, Marianne Bertrand, Eric Hurst, and Nick Epley. For more research, analysis, and commentary, visit us online at review.chicagobooth.edu and join us again next time for another big question. Goodbye.